Welcome to 30 Minutes of Faith. We're very happy to have Mary Wesley with us today, a friend and an avid worker in Greater Sacramento. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, John. Tell us where you were born and raised. I was born in Antigo, Wisconsin, and raised in Antigo and Wausau and Manaqua and Madison and Richland Center and Stevens Point. <laughs> and what brought you to California? Uh, my husband had taken a job as state welfare director in Nevada. And so we moved to Nevada and then he became ill and he needed more uh, medical care. And so we moved to Davis and then graduated. I came to Sacramento. So you've been here lots of years? Many. Raised your children here? Raised them in Davis. Davis, a good Most place. Most of Davis. A good place. <laughs> What got you started in being involved in the community? Um, I took over the, I, where I developed the senior programs for Yolo County. And why? I mean, why, was that your job or? Yeah, I took, I took it on as a part-time job and then it evolved from there. And did it go the way you hoped it would go? Well, I made a lot of, a um, lot of friends. Uh, we changed things a lot I, because I made them active and politically active. And when bills came up in the legislature and they were going to affect senior citizen programs, which were almost non-existent at the time, um, we'd load up, my children would load them all and we'd go around Davis and pick up people in wheelchairs and on crutches and we'd head down to the Capitol. And then they got very, you know, very active in it. Uh, Phoebe German at that time was at the Broderick Christian Center, and Sheila was here at the Camellia, Sister Sheila Watts. Right. Tell us more about Jericho and uh, the other things that you've been involved with through the years, because a lot of these things we've springboarded to or for or from. Well, um, I met Sister Sheila more than 40 years ago. And we became friends and she kind of pulled me in. And so when she started Jericho 26 years ago, um, of course I got pulled in. And I did the fundraising. I wasn't on the board at the time, but I was chair of the fundraising activities and anything else we could think of. And you know how she was. <laughs> like John Burton said, you no. can't say no to you Sister Sheila. Say no to her. <laughs> What about, were you raised in a religious home? I was. And so did the religious things come sort of natural? Well, I think it was even more than religious. Of course, like I call that religion. Um, it was more that you follow what Christ taught. You love your fellow man, you, you do for each other, or part of each other, and you have a responsibility to each other. I don't care if it's to a friend or to a stranger. We were responsible. And that's the way I was raised. Do you have siblings? I, there were eight of us. I lost a brother in an accident, a sister to cancer. Um, and so the rest of us are very close. And my sisters are my best friends and their husbands. And I spend a month, we spend a month together every summer. In Wisconsin? In Wisconsin. It's a beautiful state. Up at it. Beautiful. Eagle River up at the cabin. <laughs> and um, your grandparents, did you know them as a child? They oh, I knew area? my grandparents and my great-grandparents. Wow. Um, the family was always very close. And uh, did you take the lead from anybody on the way you've lived out your life or did you sort of develop yourself? Well, I think you live the way you're taught. Uh, uh, the, the whole surrounding, you know, your many influences. And, and it sets your personality. Your dad and mother proud of their children and say, wow, look at our kids, they're doing well? Oh yes, oh yes. They were always there. They led the Girl Scouts, they led the Boy Scouts, they led the band parents at the high school. They, you know, were very involved in the community. It's fun to live in a home where everybody's active and busy doing something and you kind of forget yourself and step into other people's lives. Well, that's it. And, you know, in my home, 
my parents were both musicians, not professional musicians, except my mother was a pipe organist that did a lot of professional concerts. But um, my dad was a grocer. Uh, he had supermarkets at the end. But um, there was always music. And so there was an influx of young people, always with my mother accompanying him, preparing him for auditions, preparing him and, uh, to, for concerts. And everybody in my family sings and plays, sings and plays. Well, that would lead into what you do with music in this community. Tell us more about that. Well, I have the, I've been involved in a number of groups, but the last one is last 15 years. I started along with another person who has dropped out. Um, the Camerata California is a chamber choir and chamber orchestra. And we perform in this area, we perform coast to coast. Uh, we have a student scholarship program that's been very successful. We provide money every month for young promising musicians in the local colleges. And it's been a really good program. Now we're upping it to include uh, the orchestra. We're using young, young people in our orchestra. Are you a soprano? On contralto. Oh. <laughs> When did you discover that that's what you'd sing? I mean, did you, were you I always sang. 13 years old? You'd... I've been singing all my life, I think. I, could, I think I learned to read music right along with learning to read words. Yeah, just, it, it's the way we were brought up. You sound a bit like my mother. My mother's the 17th of 21 children and they were all really good musicians because their parents were. Um, does music still take you places inwardly that are satisfying and helpful to you? I can't imagine living without music. I just can't imagine it. I agree. It's, and it's so important for the community. It's so important for the community to keep a symphony orchestra, keep an opera, you know, th make the things available to our community and our young people that are just coming up because it does something to the soul. It's a universal language, isn't it? It really e is. Everybody understands it. Are we going to win the battle of the symphony and the opera and all those other things here in Sacramento? Oh, I hope so. I oh, do I hope too. so. It's, you know, we just don't have the money. Uh, it's scarce. Uh, fundraising is difficult. It's the most difficult job I have. You know, a couple of days ago, I spent two hours on the phone talking money, and, and every single person I talked to said, we have a little money, but we've got it set aside for our purposes. We don't have much to set aside. And yet, America continues to be great gift givers. And, you know, America leads the world on people who are willing to share with what they have to benefit other people. But times are just awfully tight these days. Well, and they don't, it isn't a priority. Music, well, we have a whole um, a group of younger people now who were brought up without music in the schools because they cut, when they cut back, they cut the music programs. They cut the art programs. And so they've never been exposed. And so one of the big things now is trying to get art back in the schools and make it a you know, really important thing. How is that going to happen? Well, we have, um, there are many groups that work with uh, schools bringing programs back. Uh, Mayor Johnson, uh, got a grant, and so he's working on in that group. Arts Alive is working on it. Uh, the Vita Academy uh, has music in the schools, and they're working under a federal grant, bringing music back in, getting children the knowledge. Uh, and so it's very vital. The arts are very vital to the community. Do you have a favorite era of music? I don't know. One of the big things that I've been doing with Camerata is I try to feature a living composer on every concert. And there are wonderful, wonderful composers out there. And people think about living composers, they think of, of atonal and, and clashing and stuff. That's not true. There are wonderful, wonderful composers. Do you like Broadway music? I do. I like all kinds of music. I even like Michael Jackson. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How about big band? I like big band. I like big band. <laughs> well, well, it's reminiscent of childhood or young, the days when we were active and dancing and 
you know, M music it's memories. Is, it's memories. Music is such a wonderful thing. And a song can take you back somewhere where you well, were. You can remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, right. who you were with. When you ask me to say the same thing, when you ask me to look for photographs, I mean, it's been a memory trip going through all the things. And, that's, and each one brings, and that's like the memories from the music starting it. No, well, thank goodness for cameras. My wife and I were in Paris a few years ago, and we were at the Eiffel Tower. And we were just buying tickets and things, getting ready to see. And we could hear a man's chorus just all of a sudden start up. And we turned around and back behind us quite a ways were guys standing in soccer uniforms, about 40 of them. And they were singing a song that we didn't know, but it sounded very Eastern European and majestic. So we walked over and it turned out to be a soccer team from, I don't remember, the Czech Republic or somewhere. But they had just decided to out with a couple of songs while they were standing mm -hmm. there waiting to go on their tour. And it was, uh, it, it stopped everybody. There were thousands mm -hmm. of people there at the Eiffel Tower, and it just stopped everybody in their tracks. And as soon as they stopped singing, everybody cheered and clapped mm -hmm. and all this, and the guys stopped singing, and then everybody just dispersed and went on their merry mm -hmm. way to wherever it was they were supposed to go. And I said to my wife, there isn't anything else that would have stopped that. I mean, I guess you could have had an explosion or something, mm -hmm. but people would have ran from that, and this just magnetized and drew everybody in. How often do you perform? Well. This year we performed more than what we have other years. Uh, we did one, two, three, four, four concerts. Uh, we will be doing the, um, our next concert will be Memorial Day, which we always do. Uh, to Where? Honor. Where? It, it'll be at First United Methodist Church. And, and how big's the choir and how big's the orchestra? The choir is uh, 18 voices. And the orchestra varies according to the literature that we're going to perform. And we'll also be opening, we'll be the opening uh, group for the opening concert of Gay Pride Week in San Francisco, <laughs> which is going to be interesting. We'll have to take a bus down. Well, good for you guys. Way to go. Um, now, we know how busy you are in your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? And are you just going to do that till you can't even lift a pen or hit a computer key anymore? Well, somebody will be sitting across from me and I'll be 110 and I'll be saying, oh, <laughs> tell me about that number. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something you're good at and you like to do and... Well, yeah, oh. I've been doing it so long that my clients are my friends and I have a very large practice. But we're, I look forward to seeing them. That's and nice. it's a reunion. Each person provides me with a reunion. And so do you sort of see them early in the year, then you don't see a lot of them till early the next That's year? That's right. And then I, I also probably have their children and their grandchildren and <laughs> maybe great-grandchildren as well. That's very, very cool. Do you have hobbies? Music, art. Uh, do you paint or draw? I paint. I don't is, have any time for it anymore. Is that as soothing? I was reading about uh, President George W. Bush the other day and all the painting he's been doing since he took up doing that, taking a page out of Winston Churchill's book, he said, that mm -hmm. he would find it relaxing and satisfying and enlightening and all of those things. Mm -hmm. I just wish I had more time to do more things because I also have race for the arts and now that's heating up and we'll be, we, we're a fundraising vehicle. Uh, for all the arts in the community. We had 137 schools took part last year. Tell us about some of the other things you've done in years gone by with Christmas and homes and yeah. <laughs> shelter. And well, I had and the spirit of Christmas and I started that a long time ago. Then it ran, I think, 27 years before I closed down because it was just, I just couldn't do it anymore. And we served over 65,000 children in the Sacramento area. And I would, it was an adopt a family and the teachers in the schools would follow families all year and then they'd give me the list. And I'd go to a business and then say, how about adopting the George Smith family? And I'd give them all the particulars and then they were, they took it off. You know, they did everything. Were they sorry when you closed? Um, a lot of the recipients, I still get calls. Oh. I still get calls. And uh, I remember that Daryl Steinberg 
was always my vol Christmas volunteer because, of course, he didn't celebrate Christmas. And so on Christmas, he manned the phones and took care of any problems. Yeah, he's a good guy. He really is. He's a good guy. How about some of the other things with housing and legislation and some of those other things? Well, you know about Jericho. Right. And Jericho is the advocacy for justice. And I think that probably my biggest passion is social justice, live in a just world. And why? why? Why did you come to that? What makes that passionate for you? Because people, you know, deserve things, I think. Like, p old people deserve a decent old age. They've put, put in years. The uh, children deserve to have a roof over their head and, and food in their stomachs. I think that's because we're part of each other and, and we have to uh, look at each person as part of ourselves. Why don't we generally as a society get that though? Why does somebody have to lead the charge and bang the door and why, why don't we get that? I think there's a lot of selfishness and a lot of greed. The people are basically selfish. Uh, if you they take care of themselves first if anything's left over. And historically, it's probably throughout the ages been the way it works. So then there has to be activists through the ages to try to help, mm -hmm. I suppose. I believe that. And uh, do you sleep well at night? You're happy that you've made it a good effort in your life and things are going forward? I think so. Good. I, uh, it's always a challenge. Well, you're well respected and looked up to by many. Will Jericho, going back to them for a minute, will they survive now that Sister Sheila's gone? Well, I've, it's, it's a terrific board. It's a terrific board. Good. And if there's a difference is going to be made, it's, it's because of the board members. Well, they, they also have a strong reputation <laughs> of good things that are being done. How do you feel about Sacramento in general as far as, you know, in, our, in interfaith, we're trying to, mold and mesh everybody to similarities and commonalities and not deal so much with differences. And you know, this whole Council of Churches thing started 103 years ago and you know, we've reinvented ourselves a few times, but how, how do you think Sacramento is going to go? I think it goes well because you know, we are probably one of the most diverse cities in the world. And and there seems to be, and that seems to be the commonality, uh, that it's developed uh, together. It's not like we have the separate enclaves that they have back east, where you have your Polish community, your German community, your Irish community. Right. Um, I think Sacramento is a, one of the most wonderful places to live because we do have caring people and it's just, I always say when I go home to Wisconsin, you may all have your yards without fences. And we have fences, but we care about each other. And that's the difference. You know, um, I think just with the influx of what happens in Sacramento for a lot of different reasons, I, I have strong beliefs about the I-5, you know, I-80, corridors and the, everything that goes there have strong feelings about Sacramento being the capital city of the largest state and yet it's still a very small town by compared to you know many others there's a lot more bigger cities in California that could be the capital and then um, you know we're still pretty rural just outside the boundary it's not like we flow along there for 40 miles up the freeway and 30 that direction so I, I think that's one of the good things about diversity, but I think that also attracts um, challenges. It does, but you know, I always say that Sacramento is still has, has a small town feeling. It does. We're, and that makes us different, different than other communities. And I don't know why that is, but it, but it is. You can walk down the street and you know this person and that person, and you still do. And do you think it'll stay that way for another few generations? I think it will. 
I, I hope you're right. I, I, I'm optimistic that it will because that makes it really, really unique. And there's a fine balance there between, you know, mm -hmm. what's city and what isn't. Well, maybe it's something is we're a little more politically active because it's the capital. So politics are, are not as skewed. You know, 25 or 30 years, if peop people would say to me, now tell me exactly where Sacramento is. I think the Kings put, sort of put Sacramento on the map. Everybody started watching the NBA and said, oh yeah, and, and Phil Jackson and Bill Walton were talking about the cowbells and all that other sort of stuff. But it, you know, in a good positive light, put us on the map. And, and then at that point in time, people were just saying, just sort of automatically, well, it is the capital city of California. And everybody would say, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, I, I memorized that in grade school. But I, I didn't know if Sacramento was in the Los Angeles basin or, you know, sitting next door to San Francisco. So uh, where do you see yourself in five or ten years? Dead? No. <laughs> well, I hope not. No. <laughs> You just keep just keep going and just keep plugging. Oh, I'll still be doing all my interests. I hope and I'll have my business and I'll have the choir and I'll have hopefully Jericho how's and your, race for the arts. How's your health? <laughs> my health's good. Good. And do you get to spend time with children, and grandchildren, and things routinely for? Just about every day. Oh, good. <laughs> Our family's very close. Good. Families. A big, big deal, and they keep you feeling young, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. But you know, your your lives are so integrated. That's a nice way to say that. I hadn't stopped to think about mm -hmm. you are just meshed there. Um, will it matter to Sacramento how religious we may or may not be, and how political we may or may not be, and how educated we may or may not be? What, how, what will we build on and what won't matter in the years to come? I think those things will always matter. It's the grounding uh, that religion gives. Um, it's the education that produces the people that are going to govern and, and make things happen. Yeah, those things are all very important. I noticed the other day in one of the papers that talked about um, some cities are a little more stale, some are real progressive. If you take a pocket like the greater Sacramento area, you might find, you know, it, it didn't say this, I don't remember, but you know, maybe you find Folsom real progressive, maybe you find Fair Oaks real low key, you know, da 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 da, mm -hmm. and, and then you find outlying places, Elk Grove or out in Woodland or Davis and things are. They have strong identities under themselves, and and yet in the world, if some if you're out traveling, somebody says, "Where are you from?" Most everybody just says Sacramento. That's right. <laughs> and you know, okay, well, so, you know. Well, it uh, says it all. Sure, sure. Um, where were you when Gerald Ford was tried to be assassinated? I mean, he didn't try to, but when that happened, were you downtown somewhere or close by or? You know, I don't remember. Okay. Where were you when John Kennedy was killed? I was in Wisconsin. Um, Do you remember? I, was, I remember exactly. I was cutting my brother-in-law's hair <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> and it came on TV or radio or uh -huh. whatever. Um, I ask a couple of those questions because I, you know, we went through that period of time for about 15 or 20 years where the assassination attempts or the assassination, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, you know, it, it looked like that was the track this country was going to follow. And I just couldn't hardly believe it. And the, the one upbeat part of politics and being a religious community and that these days is we're being a little more decent. We still mm -hmm. shout and shake our fist and rant and rave a little bit, but we're being a little more decent. Do you agree with that? Um. I'm not sure I do. Okay. Maybe, maybe we're not assassinating presidents, but uh, I think that politically uh, the parties aren't very nice to each other, uh, <laughs> or the uh, politicians. I'll have I mean, to say that they're not very friendly with each no. other. The gap has really widened, hasn't it? It's big time. How will we solve that? 
uh, elect people that will represent us and not parties. Will we ever elect people again who are just the common folk like we used to do 75 years ago well, instead of some high-powered whatever? Get the money out of politics. I think Citizens United was a terrible decision. It um, changed the whole scope. Will it be a popular run and then go away? I hope it'll go away soon. I would have to re I can don't know the, if you changed the court or not or what happened. Can the preachers and the priests and the ministers help us inside our houses of worship when it comes to those kinds of things? I'm not sure if that should be from the pulpit. Um, some do. Yes. Some don't. Um, I, th I think that it's, uh, you develop your own conscience, which should be uh, a real model. Or, or you could talk about both sides, but I don't think you can. When you were a child, do you remember a preacher or a pastor who led the way? Never, never politically. And did your parents talk politics at home? Oh, yes. And did they, you feel like they shaped you or you shaped yourself? Probably I shaped, that way I shaped more myself. <laughs> very good. Well, we're drawing near an end. I'm very, very happy you'd spend time with us. I'd want to ask you one last question and that is, if you could wave a magic wand to fix or repair or improve something in society, what would that be? To get rid of poverty. That's the breeding ground for many of the problems today. That's a nice way to say that, the breeding grounds. Well, Sacramento was active in that. You know, we're, we're mm -hmm. trying to do a lot of things. Sometimes it feels like one step forward and two back, but, but Sacramento plays an active part in that, and I hope we can resolve that. The mayor has tried to do well, I think. Yes, he okay. has. Thank you very, very much for being here. It's nice to visit with you. Nice visiting with you. All right. Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye, John.